Death Valley serves as a reminder of nature's power with its unforgiving heat and rugged terrain. For one family, it was supposed to be the trip of a lifetime. Egbert Remkes, his girlfriend, and their two children left the Death Valley Visitor Center at Furnace Creek on July 22, 1996, ready for adventure. Having already spent a couple of days along the California coastline and making a brief stopover in Las Vegas, the German family was headed to Yosemite National Park. Between them and their final destination lay Death Valley, a barren wilderness of scorching heat and rugged terrain. The family had decided to travel along the mountains, seeking refuge from the unforgiving heat of the valley floor where temperatures could soar to over 130 degrees Fahrenheit. At nearly 5,000 feet elevation, the air was a little cooler, but the midsummer sun still beat down mercilessly. They made their way along the Rocky Mountain Trail of Anvil Canyon, once used for mining access, when their journey took a fateful turn. The trail deteriorated and Egbert lost track of what was road and what was sand. The family's two-wheel drive minivan became stuck. They were stranded in the middle of the harsh Death Valley landscape with no water and no means of communication. Their flight home awaited them on the 27th, but not only would they miss their flight, they would never be seen alive again. Park Ranger Dave Brenner was on a routine helicopter surveillance mission, scouting the park for illegal activities. He hadn't noted anything of interest that day until he spotted the minivan, a small dot on the desert landscape. Although it was prohibited to drive on the old road, he normally wouldn't have paid much attention, but he found it odd that a passenger car had made it so far into the desert. He decided to land. Approaching the car, it looked like it had been there a while. The tires were buried in sand, it was incredibly dirty, and he could tell it had been driven on flat tires. But the doors were locked, and no one was around. He radioed the license plate in to Highway Patrol, and found the car had recently been reported stolen. It was a rental that had never been returned. The car was rented to a group under the names of Egbert, 34, his son, Georg, 11, Egbert's girlfriend Connie, 28, and her son Max, 4. He noted they had missed their flight out of the country on July 27th and an Interpol alert had been put out. On October 22nd, the search started. Egbert and his family had chosen their route through the desert based on the maps they had purchased at the visitor center. They carried two copies of the Death Valley National Monument Museum text. Their route would bring them past some attractions such as Charles Manson's old ranch and the ghost town of Ballarat. They figured they might as well enjoy the drive. They left the visitor center on the night of July 22nd, and despite the bumpy and neglected roads, the family managed to conquer Hanaupa Canyon. They would reach Yosemite the following day. Confident with their progress, they decided to camp in their trusty minivan for the night. Just before first light the next morning, to beat the heat, they continued. The road led to Warm Springs Camp and was in slightly better condition, giving little cause for concern. They stopped at the camp, expecting it to be inhabited. However, upon arrival, they discovered it abandoned. Despite this, they did find a visitor's log to sign. Egbert's girlfriend Connie signed the log, writing in German, We are going over the pass. Connie, Egbert, Georg, Max. As they pushed towards Butte Valley, the road became increasingly perilous, causing their anxiety levels to rise. The risk of getting stuck was a real possibility, but they felt they had come too far to turn back now. Eventually, they arrived at Stone Cabin, a remote stop for travelers that provided basic supplies and water. However, they found it too abandoned. Unaware of the severity of their predicament, they failed to take advantage of the additional food or water. Continuing on, it became clear that the van couldn't go any further. Egbert got out on foot to look for an alternate route, but he realized it was futile and they had to turn back. Now they had a problem. The sun was already setting and it would take them at least two hours to return the way they came. Time was not on their side if they still wanted to visit Yosemite and make it back to LA in three days. However, their visitor center map offered a seemingly alternative yet misleading route back down to the valley. 
Anvil Canyon was no longer a legally accessible road as of 1994. It was not maintained, yet the map failed to tell them that. The family doubled back to the stone cabin and this time turned on to Anvil Canyon Road, feeling relieved as the first one and a half miles were relatively smooth. This confirmed their decision and gave them a false sense of security to press forward. They entered the mouth of the canyon. Egbert quickly discovered his map had deceived him. The road was not so much a road as a rocky, sandy, barely worn path through the desert, challenging even for off-road vehicles, not to mention a minivan. Knowing they were already in loose sand, Egbert continued to drive, as he knew stopping would make it impossible to gain traction again. He kept his speed up, then the rocks started taking out the rear tires. Egbert managed to navigate through the challenging terrain for over two miles on flat tires, but his luck ran out. He mistook a fork in the road and his vehicle became trapped in the unforgiving, sandy terrain. His left front tire blew as well. As the family found themselves stranded in the blistering heat, they were unaware of the looming danger. With temperatures reaching 107 at their current elevation, it was hot and could be lethal. While misguided though, their primary concern was getting their van back to Los Angeles in just a few days to catch their flight. Egbert felt flustered and frustrated, not wanting to appear uncertain in front of his children. He set out on foot to get a better view of the surrounding area and come up with a plan. After walking for over a mile along the canyon, he arrived at a viewpoint. There he sat down on the ground and cracked open a cold beer, oblivious to the fact that his body was in desperate need of hydration and he was only making it worse. As he sat, he examined the map, comparing it to his view. Ballarat was many miles away, Furnace Creek was far to the north out of their reach, and he wasn't sure anymore what was abandoned and what was inhabited. But there was another possibility. The map showed the China Lake Naval Weapons Center less than nine miles to the south of them. It didn't appear that far and was only half the distance as the nearest paved road was. After formulating his plan, Egbert headed back to his family. The group then spent the night at the van. Early the next morning with the direction in mind, they locked the vehicle taking a few supplies and headed east down Anvil Canyon to a little past Egbert's thinking spot the night before. Then they turned south. Investigator Eric Inman opened the minivan's doors. Inside, he didn't find much. A camera with some family pictures, food wrappers, toilet paper, alcohol, some camping gear, and other family items. It was clear the van had been abandoned. Miles away, the visitor log book from Warm Springs camp was found and gave a little insight into why the minivan ended up where it was, but no insight into where the family now was. The following day, a full-scale search began. There were over 45 searchers in the field, two helicopters in the air, and eight horses on the ground at any given time. Costs for the search were approximately $80,000. While very extensive, it concluded after four days. The only thing they found was Egbert's empty beer bottle at the viewpoint where he hatched his plan. No other trace of the missing family was found. Tom Mahood, a search and rescue worker with Los Angeles County, began reading about the case. He became fascinated by the story and determined to get to the bottom of it. He reviewed past search attempts and theories as to what happened to the family. Search and Rescue had thought of as many scenarios as they could at the time, but he noticed they hadn't focused many efforts in the direction of the military base. They had assumed it was the last direction anyone would logically decide to go. With a new search plan of his own, Tom reached out to a friend and fellow enthusiast, Les Walker. He pitched the idea and Les was immediately on board. The two headed out to the desert. They searched along their planned route for days, and finally, on November 12, 2009, they found Connie's remains, confirmed by her ID and her wallet, eight miles from the van and just four miles from the military base. The site was found with an empty wine bottle. As the family ran out of water, they turned to the only liquid they had left, likely accelerating their tragic outcome. 
Later testing of the bones around the area revealed some also to be Egbert's. The children have never been found.